My guest today is Professor Irina Van Dier. She holds a PhD in economics from Boston College and is a professor of economics at the LSE. Moreover, she is co-editor of Econometrica and vice president of the European Economic Association. She has conducted extremely influential research in developing and developed countries using randomized controlled trials. Good evening, uh, Oriana. We are really, really happy to have one of the most creative uh, researchers in Europe. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have you here and, and uh, thanks for making some time for us. Also, high official of the European Economic Association, the Professor Nelsi, all of those things. Um, Oriana, um, one uh, recent paper you've done, uh, a 2019 paper, is about uh, the, the impact of Ebola. And when you were doing your research, uh, suddenly the Ebola pandemic came to the villages you were studying and there was lockdown and there were changes. And you actually had the chance, I mean, within the tragedy, of actually studying those effects. Uh, why don't you tell us what you learned and then we talk a little bit about what it could suggest for the COVID shock in the developing countries. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me here, Luis. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Um, the study with Ebola was an evaluation of a program run by the NGO BRAC, in, uh, first in Uganda and then exported to Sierra Leone. And this program offers clubs for adolescent girls where the girls learn livelihood skills, so basic training in jobs, and um, as well as uh, life skills, so how to protect themselves from unwanted attentions, let's put it this way. And uh, uh, we ran the baseline of that program and then Ebola struck, and so we had to stop. But the program went on, and, uh, and so we can compare the effect of Ebola in villages where the girls had been offered the program and in villages where they hadn't. And there are very big differences between the two. And in particular, pregnancy rates skyrocketed in villages where there was no program, because with schools closed, girls have not much to do other than spend time with men. And we measure time use, and we see that that's effectively what they do. They spend a lot more time with men. Whereas in villages where the program was operating, the girls had a safe space, which is the club, where to be, as well as they had learned skills to resist unwanted advances. And so there is a difference in pregnancy rate, which then has very important dynamic consequences because the Sierra Leone government uh, prohibited pregnant girls from going back to school. So the girls in the control villages ended up basically dropping off from school for good. Whereas the girls in treatment villages having resisted the pregnancy managed to return to school and so went on a completely different trajectory. So given that we don't expect, uh, I mean, interventions like yours in most developing world places, is your expectation that we would see a, a real differential impact on girls and boys, on, on we, young women and young men, uh, with long-lasting consequences, as in your paper, uh, as a result of COVID, similarly to what you observed uh, with Ebola? I fear that the mechanisms at play are quite similar because uh, what played a role there was the schools were closed and so girls had nowhere to go. And so they were more easily prey to the attention of these men who were also not at work. So it, it was basically a perfect storm. So I think yeah, it's not the type of illness, but the consequence of the lockdown. So you have actually studied uh, uh, the, the lockdown in, in more detail uh, specifically in a paper on, on Bangladesh. Uh, you did a very, very large survey. Uh, what, what are the results of the survey? What, what is the main uh, way that, that you found the lockdowns have been affecting uh, people? So, you know, that's part of a bigger project of mine in Bangladesh, where we study the link between jobs and poverty. And so our goal there was to see how the lockdown affected the livelihood of people, depending on the type of job that they had at the beginning. And we found important differences, like salaried workers uh, survived better, people who had a business were most affected because they had to close down their business. But actually what we weren't expecting and what we found much stronger evidence of was that people changed jobs after the lockdown. So we found that only 60% of business owners kept their business. 
the remaining 40% transitioned into casual labor, like daily labor. And interestingly, those who did transition were poorer, a baseline. And likewise, we see uh, people transitioning from casual labor onto salaried labor, and from salaried labor back to casual labor. And when we look at the wealth, we see that it is the richest who get the better jobs. And so this has two consequences. It increases inequality, obviously, mm -hmm. but it also creates misallocation because the firms of the poorer workers that shut down are more profitable than the businesses of the richer workers that manage to survive, as well as the business of the richer workers who open to take the place of those who have shut down. So there is, uh, you know, the shock has more permanent consequences on the labor markets than we previously realized. So you, you talk about permanent consequences on, on education and with long-term impact potential of things like differential pregnancy rates. You talk about permanent consequences in the labor market. Um, how do you think uh, the impact of the COVID and the lockdowns that were associated with it, especially in the first wave, uh, is different in the developing world? Do you think there is, there is things that are particularly uh, different there? What's your view on, on, on what, you, what you have learned from these places? What, what are the different impacts and how are the policy interventions that are required different? Well, it depends on what the lockdown can achieve. You know, if the aim of the lockdown is to slow down the transition of people into hospitals to make sure that there is space for everybody, then there is a reason for that. But in many of these places, there are no hospitals and there are no ventilators. So slowing down the access to something that does not exist hardly seems a goal worth pursuing. Whereas on the other hand, a safe, sure consequence of the lockdown is that some people have got nothing to eat. And the other thing that we find in Bangladesh is that uh, social assistance is only targeted, only manages to reach people who have salary jobs. And as I told you earlier, these tend to be the wealthiest. So uh, would, would you, I mean, what you're hinting at is that maybe lockdowns are the wrong policies for developing countries. There was, there was a very famous uh, case in, in, uh, in India where the lockdown was very sudden, everybody was going back home suddenly, and then they were kind of spreading, it seemed, more than, than containing. Is, is your view that here um, it's, the case for lockdowns is not, is not very clear cut for those reasons that you've mentioned? Yeah, because we have all the same costs that we have in uh, richer countries, but none of the benefits in terms of the healthcare staggering. Right? So, so basically, in, in some sense, uh, when, we, when we talk about uh, the right policies, we have to think of, of, of different... One thing that you have been uh, thinking about, and, and, and it's a different policy for different places, is the idea of... Uh, what is the poverty, how do we take care of people who are um, at poverty levels, etc. And it's not just uh, the poor people suffer more um, from less resources, but poor people have less resilience, less ability to cope. What are the right ways to address poor people? And I wonder if some of those things are also use useful for dealing with poverty in places like the UK, like Italy or like Spain. Absolutely, because I think the nature of poverty is the same everywhere. Uh, poverty is essentially a limit on the set of opportunities that you have. And uh, unfortunately, we see more and more that it's not correlated at all with the talent that you have for those opportunities. So in Bangladesh, uh, some 15 years ago now, we evaluated a program that started 15 years ago, and we've been following the people for the last 15 years where we gave the poorest women in the poorest villages of Bangladesh a cow. Now, uh, not us, the NGO gave them a cow. Uh, cows, cow rearing is what the richer women in these villages do. And if we believe that women are poor because uh, they don't know how to do cow rearing, then upon receiving the cow, they should just waste it and return to poverty. But nothing could be farther from the truth. Most of the women who received the cow did very well with it. 
and they, their children were better nourished and taller. They were more likely to go to school. And you know, 12, 15 years later, we see that the children have better jobs. So there is an intergenerational transmission of poverty, which gets interrupted by breaking the poverty of the mother. I find, I, I find that work really, really fascinating. I mean, you have uh, the, this Bangladesh paper, kind of, it shows that, I mean, if we can, I don't know if we can interpret it really much more broadly, but I think we, we, we can try, right? That if uh, barrier, that poverty, poverty results from people having barriers to access certain resources in that just giving them the resources in itself, it doesn't require much more. Is, is sometimes sufficient to eliminate those traps, right? Uh, it's, it's kind of counter to what I, I would imagine many people would have thought in, in our field, right? I would say so, because most of the programs that are meant for the poor are meant to assist consumption. So they are very small transfers. Now, a very small transfer can do very little when people have next to nothing. So if you think of microfinance, for instance, Microfinance gives you the equivalent of, uh, say, $100 is the standard microfinance loan. Mm -hmm. The value of the program that we gave, we evaluated with RAC, was $1,000. So it's a difference of a factor of 10. The program that RAC gave was the equivalent of one year worth of income for these people. The microfinance loan is about one month. Mm. So it's no surprise that the microfinance, which was you know, intended to help production ended up just being a consumption subsidy, like most policies. So I think that's why we haven't seen as much evidence of this as we should have had, because most programs are not quite as generous as needed. So, so this is uh, quite promising because I think, I mean, and you know this little show much more than I do, but a lot of the uh, I mean, your work fits within a broader literature that is actually doing experimental work. And, and uh, for, for people who don't follow it, these randomized controlled trials, a bit like they do with vaccines in medicine, basically having a control group, like, like you explained at the start with this uh, Rwandan. Uh, was it Rwandan? Where was this uh, first paper? Sierra in, uh, Ebola? Uh, in Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone. Um, Sierra Leone. Um, but a lot of those papers find always small results, uh, not persistent results. And here you have a very large result and a very persistent, not just in one generation, but across generations. It's pretty impressive, uh, the impact of this program. Do you think it basically shows size matters like you were arguing or is there something else? Is that we just find that we really, if we want to end poverty, we really need to invest significant resources. Is that the main lesson? Yes, fundamentally, yes, because if the nature of the technology is such that you need a big investment to overcome the barriers, giving a tiny investment does not make much of a difference. If you need a cow in order to escape poverty, giving you one tenth of the value of the cow does not help because you cannot buy a leg of a cow and then save a bit and the next year buy the other leg. You have to buy the whole animal. What, what would be the equivalent Ariana, for, for the, uh, for the uh, countries we, we know, the advanced economies? Um, I remember a, a paper, I remember the author, that gave people who were homeless a home and also found that they actually use it and don't lose it. Um, what, what would be programs that could actually be these kind of investment programs that we could try? What, what are ideas that, that people should be, should be trying for developing? We cannot give them a cow, probably. No, no, they wouldn't know what to put it. Uh, it depends on the age of the people that you want to target. If you're thinking about youth, definitely training or education, depending on their talent, you know, either a university fellowship or vocational training programs. If you're thinking about older people, uh, then maybe some skill retraining or some funds to start a small business. Mm -hmm. uh, get, yeah. It seems crucial that it wasn't the funds to buy a cow, but a cow, right? You actually give them a cow. Is that is that right? Yes. Yes, but that in itself, I don't think it makes much of a difference. When um, we did in Pakistan a very similar experiment, where in a set of villages, we had uh, a menu of assets that also included cash. 
So everybody chose the cash option, but with the cash, you know what they did? Go drinking. No, they bought a car. And they bought a car, very good, very good, so, very good. Very good, so it was actually essentially as, as effective as, uh, as the, actual, yeah. the actual cow. So, so um, one uh, issue that you're raising, which is investment in education, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on that because you've, you've, uh, you have direct experience from, from the LSE students, from, from, from children, from everything on, on this question. And you've done also a paper on university class sizes. So um, Raj Chetty, an economist at Harvard, has found that uh, the COVID interruptions, which are very differential between poor and rich, between uh, uh, girls and boys potentially, uh, affect mothers and, and fathers in different ways, that they actually have very differential impacts on, on learning. For example, Rachetti has this data on, on a math uh, program where people are doing math online, and there is very, very big differentials between uh, people with more kids with more resources and with less resources. So one worry that that many have, I have very strongly seen the situation in Spain. For example, PISA says uh, poor kids much less likely, 50% less likely to have a computer at home, which doesn't allow you to do any of this online learning. Uh, many of us are worried about how much will we see these uh, differential impacts of education affect not just today, but have long-term effects. How worried are you about this? What should we be doing? What is your, your view on the, on the impact of, of, of the lockdowns and the COVID, et cetera, on, 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 on education investments and outcomes? I'm afraid that I share your pessimism. I think it's quite worrying. And it's worrying especially because investment in education is cumulative. So once you fall behind, you're always going to stay behind. A bit like the girls in uh, Sierra Leone, once they got pregnant, they couldn't go back. So I, I think it's going to be a grand waste of talent. I, I think also that we fail to recognize how important this is for the welfare of our nations. We always think of it in terms of equity, which of course is something very important, but we can disagree on the extent to which the state should provide for people who have less. I mean, I think you should provide a lot. Other people might disagree. But one thing that we can all agree on is that we should do our best to make the best use of the scarce resources that we have. I think that's uncontroversial. And to let, you know, children not exploit their talent just because they happen to be born in a poor family, to substitute, you know, a bad doctor a, good, a potentially great doctor who happened to be born in a poor family with a kid who's not through fault of his own, much less talented, but and you know happened to be born in a rich family. It's a loss for everybody. It's not just a loss for the poor kid and the poor family. It's a loss for society as a whole. For all we know, the scientist that can find the vaccine for COVID is now not going to school. That's right. And, and, and the question is, can we do something about it? Or in terms of, can we do something like uh, all these tutoring programs, these extra schooling programs that have been... Uh, in fact, the UK has been thinking of doing something along these lines. Is this, is this something that could, uh, according to what, what we know about attainment, be at least levelling the playing field? Or is, is, it, is, it, is it hard once the education is lost? to recover? I think it's very simple. It just lacks the, the will to put in the money for it. Because if you think about it, uh, I don't know how they did it in Spain, but in the UK, most state schools gave materials to the parents to teach the children. Now, parents who are a high level of education can obviously teach better than those who don't. So that in itself created a massive gap. And not only parents with a high level of education are more likely to be able to work from home, are more likely to be able to afford the tutor. If you offer a tutor to everybody for free, we are all in the same situation. 
So I don't think it's so difficult. <laughs> yeah. What 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 about uh, I I completely I completely agree with you and I agree with the idea this is one of the highest priorities or the highest priority education is is, is the biggest probably long term impact of the pandemic. What what about university education and and here you can also tell us about your experience in in, in at the LSE. I mean we lost. Um, quite a few weeks of learning. They were substitutely replaced by Zoom in some instances, not in others. Uh, a lot of kids, and I mean, there's been a lot of difference in, in, in between different universities at being able to replace that. Um, what Do you think we are more or less able to replace university education with online learning? Are the kids basically able to, to attain comparably? What's the, what's the sense that you're getting from, from the little time that we've had this? So I must tell you that uh, I detest recording lectures. <laughs> I've started yes. recording lecture and make many mistakes. I re-record them a million times. Yeah. Having said that, I see this as a great opportunity because it can be a lot more inclusive. You don't need to be able to afford to live in central London to listen to the professors at the LSC. We can take this anywhere. And I've seen it with our conferences, you know, our academic conferences. They have increased in size by a factor of five or six because everybody can tune in and listen. Yeah. And, you know, we've organized the European Economic Association Virtual Congress and I've gone to sessions that I would have never gone otherwise just because it was virtual. So I, I think it's a lot more democratic. Uh, congratulations on that, by the way, for the whatever uh, you you that you you guys did a very good job at that at getting the Congress to to exist and to continue and to be useful. So that yeah, must have been a lot of work. Oh no, that we have to thank Gemma, Gemma Kruner Thomas, who's the secretary of the of the association. She's uh, she's really the one who deserved the, the praise. But you know, we were thinking to cancel the concert, uh, the, the, concert uh, the Congress. But then a group of us thought, what if instead of cancelling, we do the best possible Congress that can be done? And I think that that's what we did. And uh, it was better to do it like that. Yeah, my congratulations. So let me, let me finish by asking you about a line of research that has nothing to do with this, that has to do with, with incentives for workers and how, uh, and how we actually can um, facilitate people working better or increase productivity. Uh, what what do people react to? And and you've you found out a lot of interesting things about about this impact of, of working together with somebody, etc. Uh, why don't you give us a little bit of an overview of that work, uh, which um, I don't know if we can say concerned the workers picking up strawberries. I think it's a secret, but anyway. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not much of a secret anymore. <laughs> I could tell you some other secret. Uh, so about that, I think I've always been very interested in finding out what motivates people. And the fundamental idea of incentives is that you give a worker something, typically money, in exchange for something that you, employer, want, which is effort. Uh, now, people don't just care about money. They, of course, care about money to some extent, but they also care about their social reputation, they care about their friends, they care about their family, they might care about the planet as a whole. And so in a lot of this work, we were studying how the, these social concerns affected and interacted with the incentives. What I'm doing now, so, you know, all the literature in economics starts from the idea of the firm as a principal agent problem. That is, there is a boss and there is a worker. But in reality, there are many workers. And there are many layers in the organization. And most people don't know the people in the organization as a whole. So you have to worry both about the relationship among people who don't know each other, who know each other, as well as the relationship among people who do not know each other. And that takes me to something that's very close to your heart, Luis, uh, which is culture. And so nowadays we are setting up experiments to measure the culture in organizations and how organizations can change culture and the effect that this has on the motivation and the productivity of workers. Yeah, it is very <laughs> impressive, very hard to do. Nobody has done that before. And that's, that is, uh, I really look forward to seeing that. 
Uh, but there was some, uh, indeed, some very interesting results about uh, working together, knowing each other, etc. Already from your previous work, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? So, um, what can I tell you about that? <laughs> Maybe the more interesting thing that we found there is how um, the hierarchy matters. I think. Okay, let me just let me just suggest one thing that I always found very yeah. interesting: how people uh, choose friends, uh, people who are they like when they are being paid uh, fixed wages. Oh. But they tell us about that because I think it's particularly yeah, yeah. relevant is, to Spain, Italy, possibly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is quite similar, actually, to what I was about to tell you. That there is always a trade-off between money and friendship. So what we found was that when workers worked in groups and they could choose who to work with, they normally prefer their friends. Then we, uh, we wanted to implement um, a tournament, a competition between teams to see whether they could go faster. And we were about to introduce this tournament when it occurred to us that the tournament does two things. It gives you a prize, and that's what everybody focuses on, but it also gives you information on the relative ranking of your team relative to others. And to the extent that people care about relative standing, and we know that people do, that in itself can have an effect. So when we introduced the tournament, we actually staggered the two components. We first published rankings. And then a few weeks later, we also said, there's gonna be a prize for the best team. But for a period of time, people could see the rankings, but don't the price. And just the posting of the ranking changed the composition of the team because all the best, fastest workers didn't want to hang out with their friends anymore and went with the other faster workers, so to be higher in the ranks. That, in aggregate, lowered productivity because the slowest workers by themselves were even slower. So on average, the productivity was lower. And once we introduced the prices, it made up for it. Because with the incentive of the price, the faster workers started working fast enough that it compensated for the fall. But it had a massive effect on inequality, of course, because all the faster workers were together, they were winning prices, and all the slowest workers were together going slow. And I think what we learned from that is that had we only compared the effect of the tournament, we would have found a zero, precise zero effect, and concluded that maybe people don't react to money, you know, as is fashionable to say. But in reality, people do respond to the price, but they also respond to the information. It's just that the two responses cancel each other out. And that there is a lot of the heterogeneity that on average gives you this, this, this result, right? Some people really work much harder and others, and others don't. That's very, very interesting. Um, I, I am tempted, we have very little time, um, to ask you about, I think it's your very first paper in the Journal of Law, Economics and Organization on the Italian Mafia, which was uh, really, really interesting on why does the Mafia exist? And I think people will be curious to know what was your... What was your so that's a funny story about that paper, because I suddenly became an expert on the mafia, which actually I, I never was. <laughs> um, it was my, it was not my first paper, it was my term paper, you know, my second year of the PhD paper. Uh -huh. um, and I wrote it because I, I'm from Sicily, and so the accounts of the mafia that I knew from being born and brought up in Sicily were very different from the American movies. Mm -hmm. And when you go to the States, I mean, I hate to generalize, but let's say that many people, when I went to the US, the moment I told them I'm from Sicily, they would tell me, ah, Sicily, the mafia, <laughs> you know, the godfather. And yeah. I was like, it's not quite like that. And then I couldn't find anywhere an account of what the mafia was as I knew it. And as I knew it, the mafia was a sort of private police was a replacement of the state in a place where there was no state. Uh, finally, I found a book by a sociologist at Oxford, Diego Gambetta, who then became a good friend. And uh, in his book, he nailed it completely. But this was a sociology book. 
So I basically put in a theory model what he had in words and um, acknowledging him, of course. And I found some very cool data from the 1800. And so the story goes that in the 1800, uh, Sicily was one of the last places to still have a feudal system. So there were a few lords that ran the show and each of these lords had an army. Then the feudal system got dismantled. So all these soldiers that were used to violence found themselves unemployed. And in the meantime, there were many small landowners who didn't have any protection because there was no state. So there was a demand for protection and a supply of protection. So the, the soldiers started offering private services. Now, in the areas where the land was more fragmented, there was more competition among the demand side. And the cost of not being protected was higher. Because if you're not protected and everybody around you is, the thieves will go to you. And so basically what I showed is that in areas where the land was more fragmented, that there were more small landowners, the, the buyers, the sellers basically had a much easier time. And so that's where the mafia made a lot more money. And that's how we started. That is really, really, really fascinating. Thanks a lot. We covered a lot of terrain, a lot of interesting papers. There are so many more uh, interesting things you, you've done and, and uh, congratulations for that. And thanks for your time. It's really wonderful to talk to you. Very welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.